Good afternoon and welcome to the American Floral Endowments Grow Pro webinar series. I am your moderator, Karen Schneck. I am a member of the AFE's Young Professional Council and a Senior Research Specialist in Live Goods R&D at Scott's miracle Grow. I coordinate the annual flowers trials for Scott's miracle Grow and Bonnie Plants flower programs. Today's session is on birational products for botrytis control. On behalf of the endowment, I am excited to be a part of AFE's Grow Pro webinar series that features a new topic every month presented by an industry expert. The webinars are free to everyone thanks to generous support of AFE sponsors. The views and opinions expressed in these webinars are those of the speaker and do not necessarily reflect the views posi and, or positions of AFE. As an independent nonprofit, AFE cannot endorse any specific product or opinions. This month's webinar is sponsored by Mycorrhizal Applications. Mycorrhizal Applications harness the power and wisdom of natural systems to promote living soils and increase quality, productivity, and health in all industries involving soils, plants, and people. If you'd like to learn about our sponsors or are interested in becoming a sponsor for a topic, you can find that information on AFE's website at endowment.org forward slash grow pro. Today's session was pre-recorded in English by Dr. Melissa Munoz. After the presentation, Dr. Munoz will join us for a Q&A. Feel free to submit your questions through the Q&A feature or at, through the chat at any time. We'll answer as many as we can before the end of the hour. Unanswered questions may be answered through a separate email exchange. This session is being recorded and will be shared to the AFE's YouTube account. Through YouTube's accessibility features, you can access closed captions in other languages. To get us started, I'd like to share a bit about today's expert speaker. Dr. Melissa Munoz, a native of Medellin, Colombia, is, and received, is a native of Medellin, Colombia and received an agronomic engineering degree from Universidad Nacional de Colombia. In 2016, she completed her master's in 2018 and PhD at Clemson University, working with Dr. Jim Faust and Dr. Guido Chanabel to get a better understanding of the botrytis blight on cut roses and in identifying alternative practices to effecti effectively manage this disease in Colombian flower operations. She is currently at NC State University as a postdoctoral research scholar at the Mountain Horticultural Crops Research and Extension Center working on apple stress physiology. Melissa is also a member of the AFE's Young Professional Council. Dr. Munoz, welcome and thank you for presenting today on biorational products for botrytis control. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for being here. Um, it's my pleasure to talk to you about biorational products for botrytis control. And um, I would like to start um, mentioning that all the things that I will present today, they are part of the work that I did at Clemson University as part of the Jim Faust lab. And uh, some of the findings are my own and some are from other lab members uh, like Gabriela Calidon. So for all of us here, I think it's not a secret that botrytis blight it's a big problem for the industry, for different floriculture, floricultural crops. Botrytis means one of the worst problems and challenges, um, and it is still a growing challenge for several growers. So these pictures were taken recently at, um, a, at a show. And you know, for the shows, people choose the best performing flowers, the best looking ones, but sometimes it's even inevitable to have botrytis issues like you see here. So botrytis blight, as any other disease, starts with a, what we call the disease triangle. So for the disease to happen, three things need to uh, match. So the first one is a virulent pathogen, and in this case, botrytis cinerea. Uh, it's a very aggressive pathogen that can affect over 1,400 different species worldwide, and floricultural crops are no exception. 
and uh, several of our floricultural crops are highly susceptible or susceptible to some degree. Uh, in this specific case, uh, when I was working with roses, roses are very susceptible. And of course, there are some variations between cultivars, but in general, they are all susceptible for botrytis blight. And finally, the other corner of that disease triangle is a conducive environment. And this is a portion that is really tricky because for a lot of the growers, uh, a lot of the time, they are exposed to a conducive environment for botrytis plant. So I would like to start uh, going forward with that one, with our conducive environment. So for botrytis, we know that the infections start during the production at the greenhouses. And the infection starts when the spores of botrytis germinate, and they will germinate when they are exposed to high humidity conditions, uh, which are referred to over 93% 90, relative humidity and moderate temperatures between uh, 15 and 25 uh, degrees Celsius. And these are the optimum conditions, but botrytis can thrive actually through a very broad range of temperature and uh, humidity. And of course, the percentage of germination and the success of the infection will depend on uh, how long these conditions are maintained. So for uh, about one year, we were collecting data for uh, climatic data and also data from the activities that were performed at the greenhouses. And with this data, uh, in collaboration with uh, some researchers in Colombia, uh, with Ramirez, a professor at the National University, uh, we have been studying different mathematical models to see which one of these variables are more uh, related to a tritis infection. So in this case, when we look in the climatic conditions alone, uh, you will see in this graph, we have different colors and the colors represent the impact of these different climatic conditions uh, when they were evaluated on the same week uh, when botrytis was evaluated in the humid chambers, that's what BCH stands for. And then uh, the week before will be the blue, portion and up to two weeks before the evaluation. And you can see that the graph that is showing the highest scale importance uh, is the one related with the humidity of the middle third of the canopy. And it has a big, big impact when it's evaluated on the same week, on the week before, and even in the two weeks prior the evaluation in the humid chambers. So definitely the humidity uh, has a big impact on the disease. In the case uh, of the relative humidity of the environment itself, it also has a big impact, especially on the same week and the week prior. And uh, then we also have the spores, the actual inoculum source during the same week when it was evaluated was is, is going to have a big impact in the disease. So regarding the humidity, especially in the canopy, uh, it's tricky to manage it, but there are strategies that can be implemented. One strategy is improving the air movement in the greenhouses with horizontal airflow. And the idea with this is that you will have the, the canopy and you will have fans that have uh, a trajectory that is going to take the air from the and the air with water from the surface of the canopy, and this will help removing some of that extra humidity. So going back to the disease triangle, you see that I have another uh, kind of middle, uh, not an angle, but it will also have an impact in the disease and is the human factor. So um, we as humans and growers and researchers will have a big impact in the disease as well. 
and this relates to the cultural practices that are performed in the greenhouses. And as I mentioned before, we record the, the practices that happen, and we were trying to see what was the effect of these practices uh, on the spore movement. And uh, a lot of them have an impact, but we also, I will to also clarify that not necessarily the if they have an impact is going to be bad. No, they can also have uh, a good impact. So for example, here we see aligning. Uh, it's a practice when they reorganize the canopy. Uh, and so initially when the aligning is done during the same week, when the alignment happens, uh, we have an increase in the spore movement. Uh, because you are moving a lot of uh, tissue. However, in the week prior, well, when that is done the week prior and up to two weeks, then we start having a good impact relating the, the spore movement because uh, we are manipulating the canopy structure. And if we facilitate the air movement, as I mentioned before, that can be good to reduce the disease. Similarly, we have other practices that are definitely going to have an impact in the, in the spore movement. We see here uh, the third one from the top down is lichet tray cleaning. So these are these lichet trays underneath the beds and they accumulate a lot of uh, humidity and decay material. And when we clean them, of course, we're moving a lot of dairy material. So that is going to have an impact in the in this the spore movement and also the disease. So that brings me to another point and is the timely the how timely you do these activities. The better and the more preventive that you do them, the best performance that you will obtain. Similarly, we have here a dead head removal. Uh, kind of in the middle, I don't know if you can see my pointer uh, over here. So this is a dead head, what you see in the picture. And that uh, should not happen very often in the greenhouses, but sometimes that happens. But as you can see, that flower is covered with spores. And of course, as soon as you remove it, you will release in the environment a lot, uh, thousands of spores. So of course that is going to have an impact. And all of that is related to the inoculum sources. So as I mentioned, the timely removal of those inoculum sources, well, is going to have an impact on your disease. When we put the climatic variables together with the cultural practices, you will see here that some of the higher, well, longer bars that we observe are related to the climatic factors. So in general, the climatic variables have a higher impact than the cultural practices. Uh, however, you should not uh, avoid doing in a timely manner these cultural practices because they are definitely going to have an impact in the short term uh, for the disease management. So in general, botrytis is a disease that has been historically managed with fungicides. However, fungicide resistance, it's a becoming, and it has been a challenge for years at this point, and it's an increasing challenge, not only uh, for the development of resistance, but also because uh, for public perception, the extreme use of fungicides and chemicals in general it's, uh, it's not been very well appreciated. So we need to look for strategies for disease management. And here, this is kind of a, a picture of some of the evaluations that we did. Uh, this was uh, done after evaluating six shipments of uh, commercial roses and evaluating how was the fungicide resistance development. And you can see uh, in this graph, we have the y-axis represents the percentage of resistant isolates, and the x-axis has different fungicides belonging that belong to different frac codes. And you can see 
that we have high resistance to several of them and a middle resistance to the rest of them and very few that have low or, or not resistance. In this case, uh, you see that pirifluimetophen, which is the second last one, and polyoxin D, which is the last one, uh, they show no resistance. And for our future uh, references and evaluations, we use pirifluimetophen uh, as control for our evaluations. So something that is related with fungicide resistance is the pressure of fungicides that we apply. In this graph, I show uh, the relationship between the number of fungicide applications that occur before harvest uh, in the four weeks prior harvest and how that was related with resistance responses. And you can see the trend on how the more fungicides that you apply, the more that this is going to be resulting in resistance development. And the tricky portion here is that sometimes, often that resistance uh, is not only developed to one fungicide, but it can be developed to different fungicides at the time. And uh, in this pie chart here, I'm showing you, I'm showing to you that about 70% of the isolates that we were evaluating had either four, five, or six uh, frag codes showing resistance simultaneously. So this brings definitely uh, the point on the importance of finding alternative management strategies. So in that search for alternative management strategies, we start looking into calcium. And why calcium? As I mentioned, uh, this was part of what we did in Dr. Jim Faust's lab in Clemson. And one of my uh, fellow lab mates, Katie Bennett, she did some very cool uh, research on calcium with petunias, and she find calcium very promising a tool for this for botrytis blight management. So we decided to look into it with roses. But why calcium? How it works? So we know that calcium plays a very important structural component as part of the cell wall of the plants, especially specifically in the middle lamella, where calcium binds with polygalactronic acid uh, chains, which are here uh, represented as pectin. That's basically what they are. Uh, and uh, the calcium molecules create bonds uh, of ca calcium pectate uh, that block the binding site for polygalacturonases. And these polygalacturonases are enzymes that are produced by Botrytis to uh, disrupt and degrade the cell wall of the plants and then. Uh, get its entrance to the tissue. And it's here when these bonds of calcium pectate make a uh, kind of block the entrance and the action of these polygalacturonases. So it's a very important role, structurally speaking. Then we have calcium as a secondary messenger for the, uh, for the plants. And in the last decade, I will say, uh, this importance has been the point of attention for different research because uh, different calcium, si calcium signals are produced uh, depending on different stress, not only biological stress as fungi and bacteria, but also a physical a abiotic stress related with response to a salinity, drought, and other stressful conditions for the plant. So we did a preliminary assay collecting roses. Uh, well, we received roses from four different locations, uh, Colombia, Ecuador, Guatemala, and Kenya. And with these roses, we did a tissue analysis evaluating four 
a calcium content in the different tissue. And here we observe that calcium are one of the flower, sorry, petals are one of the flower tissues with the lower calcium concentration, as you can see in this graph, uh, followed by the stems, uh, stamens, and finally, uh, in the higher portion, we have sepals and leaves. And sepals and leaves are green tissue that transpires. And uh, so calcium moves uh, through the xylem and uh, it will move through transpiration. So these are a uh, transpiring tissue that are naturally more prone to have a higher calcium concentration. And then when we uh, compare this graph with how is the severity of botrytis in different tissue in the flower, we see that the, the petals are the tissue with the highest disease severity. And this graph is kind of opposite to what we see in the calcium concentration. So the tissues that have the lowest calcium concentration become the tissues that have the highest disease severity. So based on this, we, did, we performed three different experiments. In one first experiment, we did calcium spray, spray applications during rose production in the greenhouse for a, over 22 weeks, weekly applications for 22 weeks. A, then we did post-harvest calcium dips, up, dip applications on roses evaluating the natural disease pressure that was coming from the greenhouses. And we also did post-harvest calcium dip applications followed by uh, a inoculation with a spore suspension 24 hours later. So from the sprays, we had a three different doses of calcium, 500, 1, 1,000 and 1,500, and we also have a control group. And uh, in this graph, you can see this is botrytis blight severity uh, as area under the curve of disease progression. And you see that we observe a slight reduction in the disease when we use 500 and 1,000 uh, parts per million calcium. Uh, and I want to clarify that the our source of calcium for all of these evaluations was calcium fluoride. So we did observe uh, a slight reduction in this severity. However, when we did uh, the evaluation of the calcium concentration in the tissue, we did observe that with the highest dose, we had uh, an increase in the calcium concentration in the leaves, which is the, the higher graph, the top, of the graph. However, we did not see a difference between uh, the calcium concentration either for the stem tissue or the petal tissue. When we look at the post-harvest calcium deep applications, uh, we did this evaluation initially uh, with two cultivars, Orange Crush and Freedom. And in these graphs, uh, in both of them, we have our control group is represented with the blue lines. We had a commercial control at uh, this time that was hydrogen peroxide, which is represented in the kind of violet line. And then we have calcium at 1000 parts per million in the red line and 2000 parts per million in the green line. And you see, that in both cultivars, Orange Crush and Freedom, we have a, a significant reduction in the disease severity for both cultivars. A, in Orange Crush specifically, there was no difference between the hydrogen peroxide and the control group. In the Freedom, the hydrogen peroxide performs slightly better than the control. However, in both cases, our calcium treatments perform significantly better uh, over time than uh, the controls. If we focus in the orange crush, uh, we start seeing these big differences after seven days. And uh, at day 10, when the 
the flowers with the controls were basically collapsed, our flowers treated with calcium were performing uh, significantly better. And in this case, we observe a better response from the 2,000 parts per million calcium versus the 1,000 parts per million. And in the freedom, it behaved uh, similarly. It's just the, the trajectory of the disease did not follow this very steep uh, curve between days seven and 10, but it was more uh, slowly the progress observed. And in this case, there was no difference between 1,000 and 2,000 parts per million. So the overall response is that our calcium treatments definitely have a significant reduction in the disease uh, in comparison with our absolute control. And when we compare with the hydrogen peroxide treatment, our 2,000 parts per million calcium treatment uh, performs significantly better than the hydrogen peroxide too. When we look what happened at the, at the tissue level, we observe in this case, again, there was an increase in the calcium content in the leaves, even when they were not the main target of these deep applications. However, in this case, we have an increase of almost double uh, the amount of calcium in the petal tissue which was our uh, target tissue, of course. And we observe a, a similar response when we have a, the inoculated flowers. In this case, the inoculated control is represented in red. And we have our two calcium treatments, a 1,000 and 2,000 parts per million calcium in the green bars. And in this case, since hydrogen peroxide did not perform very well, we include captain and Miravis Prime as our fungicide controls, and a, we had a non-inoculated control. And in this case, a, our calcium treatments performed significantly better than the inoculated control, and they, a, the 1,000 parts per million was comparable to the captain effect. And in this case, the 2,000 parts per million calcium was comparable to Miravis Prime, which is our best performing uh, fungicide uh, for these evaluations. And is, this is basically to show you how the flowers look like, so you can get a better idea of what was really going on. And as I mentioned before, with these treatments, we were able to increase the calcium concentration in the petal tissue. And we perform a technique uh, that allow us to look inside the flower tissue to see if the calcium was effectively moving inside the petals or if it was just staying at the surface of the petals. And with this method, what we look was the cross section of the petal and we shoot uh, x-rays to excite the electrons inside the tissue and then be able to see the calcium uh, concentration in the tissue. So we have a, the epidermis top of the petal, the middle of the petal or the mesophyll of the petal and the bottom epidermis of the petals. And you see that in this graph, the middle petals were the ones where we observed the highest uh, increase in the, in the concentration uh, of calcium inside the tissue with the 2,000 parts per million uh, treatments. Uh, however, we also saw an increase uh, in the other petals, but these were the ones where we have the most significant, significant effect. And then the mesophyll or the middle portion of the petals and the epidermis bottom of these petals were showing the highest increase so yes, calcium is moving actually inside the tissue. And this increase in the calcium concentration resulted an increase in the petal strength. We uh, measure the mechanic resistance of the tissues uh, to perforation. And uh, with the 2000 parts per million calcium dip treatments, we observe an increase 
in the in the resistance to the rupture. So it increased the mechanical resistance too. We did a, a metabolomic evaluation and we were able to observe that the calcium applications actually activate different metabolic pathways involved with the plant defense. And in this case, we saw changes in molecules that belong to different pathways that have been historically related with a uh, defense responses. Uh, for example, cutin, suberin, and wax biosynthesis, they are part of that structural component of the of the of the plants. And this response was increased with the calcium applications. Then we also observed some changes in the sphingolipid metabolism, and this has been related with defense responses to different bacteria and fungi. So we were able to target that. Um, the phenylpropanoid biosynthesis, it's also one of these pathways that is related with a plant defense responses, and we observe changes in this pathway as well. So from this research, we were able to determine that first, post-harvest calcium dips are the most effective uh, way to provide calcium to the, to the flower tissue, to roses. And uh, the dips were an effective tool to reduce not only botrytis blight severity in roses, but also increase petal in the tissue. Uh, as, but also increase calcium in the petal tissue, sorry. And then uh, the application of these uh, calcium deep treatments resulted in an accumulation of metabolic defense responses uh, in the plant, which is honestly quite surprising because remember that these dips were done with harvest flowers. And so, even though they're harvest and they start as an essin process, these flowers are able to get a metabolic response and to a, a start a change of signals that can lead to defense responses and less disease severity at the end of the day. So now, I would like to change gears a little bit and present to you some of the evaluation of different birationals that was done uh, in the lab by Gabriela Calidonio. So what she did was to collect 19 different products, uh, biological products uh, and biorational products in general that include different bacteria, fungi, microorganism-derived compounds, botanicals, uh, two plant nutrients, one systemic acquired resistance inducer, and then, uh, of course, she had two uh, controls that were Miraviscrine and Captain that were the same controls that I showed to you before. So with these 19 products, she follow uh, two different methodologies. In the first methodology, uh, she applied these different uh, 19 com compounds uh, on roses using the same deep treatments that I mentioned before. Uh, and then 24 hours later, these roses were inoculated with botrytis spores. And then the roses were placed in a humid chamber and disease severity evaluation was performed after three, five, and seven days after inoculation. Then uh, here we have the response of those evaluations. So in the beginning of the graph, you will see the controls as the inoculated control and the non-inoculated control. And then is followed by the two fungicides, Captain and Fludioxonil and PDP metoclin. And here I would like to highlight that you can see that Captain was not a very 
performing very well. And this happens often because captain is a protectant fungicide. So if you have a lot of uh, latent infections already happening, well, it's not, it has no curative action. So it's not going to perform its best. Its best. Uh, however, Miravis Prime, which is fludioxonil and pediflumetophen had a, a very good response that was comparable to the non-inoculated control. So when we look into the different uh, biorationals that were evaluated, you see that a lot of them did not perform very well. We did not decrease the severity in these cases. However, for a Asibensolar, Bacillus subtilis, and a calcium and natamycin, as well as polyoxin D cells, we have a good response, a reduction in the disease severity. So uh, at this point, we were wondering if these products were not performing well because probably we were not giving them enough time to uh, act in the, in the flowers before the inoculation. So then the second methodology came in, in action and then in this methodology, the process was basically the same, but in this case, the, the treatments were applied and then the roses were, uh, in this case, the treatments were applied in Colombia directly with the growers. And then the roses were sent via air freight to Clemson. And then once that they arrived to Clemson, they, they were sprayed with botrytis, and uh, we follow the same protocol. And in this case, the results were actually very similar to the ones that we observed before, where acivensolar, calcium, natamycin, and polyoxin D had the best response uh, from the, the whole evaluation. And then we have some response from Bacillus subtilis and Pseudomonas chlorographis and trichoderma harciana. However, it was not very consistent response. So in here, I would like to show to you the, how these treatments actually look after eight days uh, in the humid chambers. And you can see the incredible response of some of these treatments when compared to the inoculated control that is totally collapsed. Uh, for example, our calcium treatment uh, here at the bottom performed very similar to the fludioxonil and pyriflumethofen, which is again, our best performing product. And you can see the significant reduction in the disease severity with natamycin, polyoxin D, and acivensolor. And of course, there is still disease, but we are applying a very big amount or of spores in this case. So with these top four uh, most promising products, uh, the follow-up evaluation was performed. So just to highlight what these products are, first is on guard calcium. This was the calcium source for these evaluations. This is an organic plant nutrient derived from soy protein and calcium chloride. And it's a liquid form, so increases the uptake efficacy of calcium, and is listed by the OMRI uh, for organic use. Then we have natamycin. Uh, the commercial product is Cibion, and this is a fermentation product of Streptomyces nataliensis, and it has been used since the 60s in different fruit products. Uh, for example, processed cheese, yogurt, and a, like processed meats. And it's also used as a treatment for ophthalmological infections. And these uh, natamycin basically prevents the spores from germinating by blocking the cell wall formation. Then we have Actigar, that is a, a plant defense a activator and a firm that are polyoxin D cells. And uh, it's uh, 
It inhibits the mycelial growth and spore germination uh, by suppressing chitin sy synthesis, which is essential for fungi in the cell wall formation. And it has a very low toxicity. So with these four products, the combination of these products was evaluated. So here I'm showing to you first, again, the controls, uh, the inoculated, the non-inoculated control, and the pirifilmetophen and fludioxonil control. Then the four products individual effect, but you can see that by themselves, they have a significant reduction in botrytis severity. And then the combination of these products. So in this case, you can see here that as Ivenzolor, S-methyl plus polyoxin D salts and calcium A and polyoxin D had a performance that was similar to the non-inoculated control and the fludioxonil and pirifluimethofen, and they perform significantly better than the products, uh, the individual products. So we have a synergistic effect between these products when the combination is making the products a uh, performance improve. So this is a, the example of how these products look after eight days in humid chambers when the inoculated controls were totally uh, collapsed and full of spores. Uh, these, uh, these calcium and polyoxin D zinc salts were performing as well as the fludioxonil and pirifluimethofen. So from this, we observed that all the combinations perform significantly better than the products alone except for acibenzolor and natamycin. And uh, this combination performed equally to the acibenzolor and natamycin alone. So in this case, there was no synergistic effect. However, acibenzolor, esmethyl, and polyoxin d salts and calcium and polyoxin d salts perform significant to our best performing fungicide, which is fludioxin, fludioxonil, and pirifluimethofen. So these are very promising results uh, of alternative products that we can use as part of an integrated disease management program to rotate and to give the, the fungicides more time and reduce the fungicide pressure uh, to have a better performance. Research, and of course, the Dr. Jim Faust lab and Dr. Gitter Schnabel lab that without them, well, this will have been impossible and all my lab mates. And I would like to highlight at this point that a comprehensive library of resources of botrytis and trips is available uh, thanks to the AFE effort for the growers. And you will find the link for that uh, library in the chat. Uh, so go and check there are um, an amazing amount of resources, very useful for the growers to use. Thank you all. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Munoz. Um, so we'll go ahead and open it up to the Q&A session now. And I have seen quite a few questions rolling in. So, Doctor, are you ready? Yes, Karen. Thank you. Wonderful. Excellent. OK, let's see. Um, so will fogging calcium work versus a wet spray? So that is a great question. And we have a couple of hypotheses about that. We did not test that, but we think uh, fogging may be advantageous at applying calcium because it offers uh, more homogeneous coverage. Because the thing with calcium is that uh, since it's not a mobile um, nutrient, you have to make sure that you have an homogeneous coverage in all the tissue that you're trying to target. So regarding the coverage, it will be probably beneficial. However, you also have to consider that, a, especially for growing tissue, you have to apply more, of, more often 
in order to get the benefits. For the case of roses, uh, we observed that, for example, with the dips, the most accumulation that we have with calcium is in the middle petals, because once that you do the dip, the petals in, in the more inside portion of the flower, they retain kind of that solution. So they are in contact with that solution for a longer time. So when you're spraying uh, in the greenhouses, some of that calcium sprays or fogs are only staying into the very outer surface of the tissue and not going inside. So you need to make sure that as more tissues are getting exposed to spores, you will also have a, those tissues being protected with the applications. Okay. And then there is a question about calcium chloride. I suppose you use that for full, calcium chloride for foliar applications? Yeah, so during the calcium evaluation alone, we use calcium chloride chloride for both the spray applications and the dips. Uh, for the second portion of the evaluation when different birationals were uh, studied, we use on guard calcium, which also contains calcium chloride, but it's in another form, uh, in a liquid form, organic form, and is more uh, easy to assimilate. But yes, in both cases is calcium chloride. In the calcium chloride, was there a wetting agent or other adjuvant used? So for a big portion of uh, the calcium evaluations, we use capsule as a, as a coadjuvant. We later perform some evaluations with, a, with capsule to see if there was actually a benefit or not from using this coadjuvant. And in our evaluations with that specific coadjuvant, we did not find an extra benefit from using it. However, there may be other coadjuvants that have a, that may have a better uh, effect at increasing the efficacy. Okay, thank you. Um, do you use on guard calcium with the poly polyoxin D salt? Yes. So uh, on one of those last uh, slides where you see that uh, calcium plus polyoxin D have a synergistic effect, when I refer to calcium there, it's actually on guard calcium on those evaluations. And then were the results similar with the calcium that was applied to the petunia? So there is not a straight answer to that. So in terms of reducing this is severity, yes. But for example, in petunia, the sprays work amazing. And in roses, the sprays did something, but not really too much, especially regarding the accumulation in the tissue. We were not able to see that a calcium concentration increase with the sprays. And one reason that we think for that is that a petunia is just a single flower that opens up. So when those sprays were performed in petunia, the, the flowers were closed but the whole flower was exposed and as it opened up, the whole tissue received the calcium spray. In the case of roses, since it's a more complex flower with different layers, as you're spraying, as I mentioned before, you're a lot of the time just covering the surface of the most external uh, petals, but not necessarily the internal petals. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why we think the sprays are not the most efficient way to provide it. However, as Katie observed on Petunia, uh, a significant reduction in the disease severity, we observe a significant reduction in the disease severity and the calcium concentration, but uh, it was more effective with the leaves than with the sprays. Okay, that makes sense. Um, Craig Yoshida made a comment saying um, he was thinking that multiple fogging applications will build up the tissue to make it stronger against botrytis spores. Uh, I think that that may be true. I think it will be worth to try. And again, the more uh, exposed that you get the tissue, the stronger the effect that you will get. And even though sometimes 
we didn't see that uh, increase in the calcium concentration, we still were able to see some effect from a, a disease management perspective because it may be related to that uh, metabolic to those metabolic responses that we also see. So yeah, I think they they will work. And again, it will depend on how much uh, you expose the tissue to calcium. Okay. Um, would fogging with xeritol followed by a fogging of a firm or on guard be a good plan for existing botrytis in a crop? I think a uh, I don't have a, a, a specific answer for that. I think it will be worth to try on a small uh, like trial arrangement. Uh, it might work. You may also uh, try the combination of a firm and calcium. As I mentioned, it has a stronger effect than the individual ones if I'm understanding correctly, but it is, it is a trial. Uh, yeah. Hopefully they'll, they'll be able to test that out because that seems like an interesting combination, but. Yeah, and also, uh, are we talking about roses or other crops? Uh, that right. would be, yeah. Um, let's see. Is there resistance to calcium? So there is no a uh, documented resistance to calcium, and we believe that because it doesn't act in just one way, but different ways structurally and like metabolically, uh, the resistance development is not as easy as it occurs with many single site fungicides. Uh, so there is no documented resistance. Perfect. Okay, we have a few minutes left. So um, I'll ask another question and see if any more questions come rolling in. But um, let's see, which calcium source was used in your experiments and why? So as I mentioned before, a uh, calcium chloride was the source for uh, all the products. Um, before I start my, my project, uh, Katie, who I mentioned before, she evaluated different sources of calcium, uh, including calcium nitrate, calcium EDTA, EDTA, and other sources of calcium. And calcium chloride was the source that had the one of the lowest phytotoxicity ratings in comparison to some other uh, calcium sources, and also uh, the best efficacy uh, together with calcium nitrate. And in the specific case of calcium nitrate, when you are uh, working with botrytis, you don't want to increase nitrogen that much because that will increase the development of tender tissue, uh, which is more susceptible. So we move forward with calcium chloride and it has the benefit that as long as uh, it's in its liquid form, it's still available for the plant to uptake. So yeah. Oh, cool. Thank you. It looks like that was all the questions we have for you. Um, thank you again for your presentation. It was very informative. Thank you very much, Karen. Yeah, of course. Oh, oh, we got we got one that just came oh. in. <laughs> oh, one one more. Sorry. Um, does an excess of calcium in the plant tissue have any negative effect on preventing botrytis growth? Um, they wanted to ask in case their calcium levels get too high. Okay, so a uh... There is literature that says that just the presence of calcium, it may be enough for uh, avoiding spore germination on botrytis. So, uh, however, uh, there is always a dose uh, recommended. So in our case, we evaluated uh, from zero, 500, 1000, and 1500 parts per million calcium as a sprays. And during those evaluations, we did not observe uh, any um, phyto uh, phytotoxicity. 
However, we start seeing a decline in the response as we went up to uh, 1,500, and we believe it may be starting to be uh, some fighter responses when applied as expressed. When we use the dips, we went up to 2,000 parts per million, and we did not observe any FIDO to this point, but we think that below that level, we may start seeing some FIDO. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, now I think that's everything. Thank <laughs> so, you all. Yeah, thanks again. <laughs> all right, so thank you for joining us today for another session of AFE's GrowPro webinar series. Join us next month with Dr. Sarah Jandrisic presenting on preparing for parvapinus on Tuesday, February 27th at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can register at endowment.org forward slash GrowPro. While there, check out our past webinar recordings, other grower-related resources, and research reports available to you free thanks to industry support. We have also recently released new the new schedule for 2020, 20, oh my God, 2024 <laughs> Grow Pro webinars, and we encourage you to check them out and register ahead. We ask that you please complete the brief survey about today's session where you can suggest additional topics and help us continue improve these, to improve these webinars. Thank you again for joining us and have a great day.